Hello and welcome. According to YouTube, I'm live. We do have to give it 30 seconds, so I know that for sure I'm live. But if you are with us in the chat, hello one and all. Good grief, so much chat. I'm going to catch up with the chat at the end. But hello to each and every one of you. So uh, hopefully, excellent, I'm being told I'm live. That's always good news, which means we can just get going. But if you are with us oh, in the chat, hello Oh, that's interesting. Good grief, so <laughs> I'd, forgo I'd forgotten to mute my iPad. OK, right. We'll try that again with me muted. That would be much better, wouldn't it? OK, I'm pushing the button. And we are indeed ready to go. So, as I say, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the second in our Mad May series. Uh, following on from deep diving data merge last week, this week we are looking at working with images in Affinity Publisher. Now, um, not necessarily just editing images, but there's lots that you can do with images. And we have a, a secret tip coming your way. So if you hang on till the end, the very last thing is a very secret tip that I think you'll enjoy. Right. If you don't know who I am, never seen me before. I'm Elaine Giles. I'm a long time computer trainer, podcast host, radio presenter on a Saturday night, too. I work with Mac OS, iOS, Windows and all types of applications, particularly, obviously, the Affinity applications, but also Scrivener, Office and even Creative Cloud at times. Right. We broadcast in 1080p. But YouTube likes to play with our minds. So there's a cog in the lower right hand corner. Go and have a look and see what they've done to you. If you don't have the red flash, you're not watching at the highest rate that we broadcast at. We have had this as low as 240p, which I don't know how you're seeing a thing. So go and check that right now. And while you're down there, if you enjoy anything that you see today, please give us a like. It really makes a difference. And of course, you could subscribe. And in addition to subscribing, you can hit the bell icon and the bell icon will give you notifications every time we go live so you don't miss anything. But let's get on with it. So images in Affinity Publisher. Obviously, Affinity Publisher is the destination to create your final output and not necessarily where you would consider editing images. But it has great image support. So first of all, it supports raster images and vector file formats, which means you can just drag and drop images in there and get going with them. But there's a very subtle difference here between opening files, placing files and working with exported files. So when it comes to opening files, so file open, it can not only open publisher files, but obviously it can also open anything from the Affinity Suite. So Affinity Photo files, Affinity Designer files. In addition to that, and added about a year ago, is the ability to open up an InDesign file. But not just a generic any kind of InDesign file. The support is restricted to IDML files. Now, many times when you get an InDesign file, either from a stock site or from a colleague, it, you can make it an, in, an InDesign IDML file. If the file that you have got that says I'm an InDesign file, but it's not an IDML file, then that won't open without you finding somebody to convert it for you, which just means open it up in InDesign and save it as an IDML file uh, or finding some way to convert it to an IDML file yourself. But if you're working with stock sites, you will find that if you do purchase a template and it's in an InDesign format, it does tend to have both both standard formats, but particularly there will be an, e an IDML with it. Can also open PDF files directly. So why that's important is if you're in Affinity Publisher and you have been given a PDF, which is the final output from somewhere else, maybe Microsoft Publisher or any other kind of desktop publishing application, and you don't have the original file, you can edit the PDF. You can actually open a PDF directly or you could actually work with individual pages of it. it also supports Illustrator files and Photoshop files. Now, that is in relation to opening files. File open, go find the file and open it. Those are the supported file types. But when it comes to placing files, which is a slightly different thing, placing a file is where you place a file into a specific area of the page you're working on. 
And placing files will either link to the original file or embed a copy of that file inside your Affinity Publisher file. And there is extended support there. It's not just Affinity Photo, Affinity Designer, InDesign, PDF, Illustrator and Photoshop. This also supports freehand if anybody goes that far back. If you do, let me know. I used to love freehand. It was great. Uh, but you've also got support for documents. So you can import text files. When I say import, you can place text files. You can place Word files. And it even interprets the styles within those Word files. You've got data in Excel. You can place an Excel file, numbers files, LibreOffice files, and many raster graphics formats. Now, obviously, today we're focusing on the graphics aspect of that. So when it comes to placing image files, you've got a huge range of support. The one that impresses me in there is WebP. WebP was a format that was developed for the web uh, to be good quality, but small file size. And it's a nightmare to work with because so few applications support it. It drives me mad every time I've got a file from the web and I'm like, no, it's WebP. But I can open it up in photo and I can convert it and I can directly work with it in Publisher. I don't need to convert it to anything else to work with it. So it supports a huge range of files when it comes to actually placing images. Now, we're talking about working with images in Affinity Publisher. And the other way that you will encounter images, potentially, is when you come to export your files. Because many people want to create an ebook. And if you look at your export options, that's not an option. You're going to have to do some incantations to make that work. Because when it comes to exporting files, it's mainly graphics format. So obviously, I think most people, when they're exporting something from Publisher, it's probably going to be PDF they go for. But there's nothing to stop you creating PNGs, JPEGs, GIFs, TIFFs, PDFs, and so forth of individual pages. So you can say export it and you can say export all the pages, but I want them PNGs or I want them JPEGs. That could be for approval from a client. It could be just to have a, um, a backup of some description of it. Um, in terms of that, what I do every time I've got a presentation, as soon as it's finished, I make sure that everything is correct in it. And so I can see it 20 years from now. I export the whole thing as individual graphics, PNGs. So there are benefits to doing that, but most people would either want an ebook or a PDF. But you need to think about exporting files because you would be exporting those files as graphics. Right. I intend to have a Q&A at the end. We always have a great chat at the end in relation to things that we've looked at today or other questions in general. So put your questions in as you go. If you can remember to put a cue at the beginning, that would help my trusty assistant, Mike, who is with me. That would help a lot. But if you forget, don't worry about it. I'm sure Mike will find them. He will be there like a bloodhound. So let's go in and have a look at working with images in Affinity Publisher. So my first job is to get Publisher open. Hopefully it's in a good mood today and it's not going to take all day. There we go. It's in a good mood. Right. So very, very first thing, I'm going to need a file. Now, I could start this with a blank file. It really doesn't matter. But I actually have a file that I'll work with and that will give us a few benefits. It's a file that we've seen before. It's one that is a real file that I'm working on. I'll get it finished in the end. And obviously, you can see we've got a lot of images in there already. We've got full cover images. We've got smaller images. We've got a range of images in a grid. And these are the things that we will be working with. But right now, I'm going to go to here and I'm going to put some pages in. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Not the master pages. Come on, don't fold up on me. I'm going to put some pages in here. So I will put in four pages and we'll make it after page 25. So it will appear before the final cover page at the end. It's used a template, uh, a master page. Doesn't really matter whether it, it does or not. But at least I'll be able to show you here that to help me with these graphics, I already have a grid. And the grid is twofold in terms of the major grid with the blue dashed lines is giving me squares. And the reason that that's important is when I'm working with my images. With these images in particular, 
I want them to be a certain size so I've got consistency like these. But this one is taking over two squares. So giving me that means I'm not randomly sizing it. I'm saying that one needs it's wider, so it needs two, two big squares. Um, the individual squares are one centimetre from memory. I, it was a long time since I set it up, but I think they are one centimetre. So when it comes to images, right, your first option with your images is to just simply drag and drop an image in. Could be from anywhere, could be from the Finder, could be from another application. I will show you that I have an application here called PicSave and I have in here lots of different sets of artwork. So I've got the MacBytes, oh, I've got my chapter markers for MacBytes, I've got the credits for MacBytes and I've got a whole range down here of icons for Mac apps and I've got the office icons. I've got the office icons, the new ones and the old ones. So all that I would need to do with this is drag and drop, drag and drop, and it drops these in. So like I say, could be from Finder, could be from anywhere. One caveat to that, when I say it could be from anywhere, it could, but if you're trying to drag from certain browsers, you might find it doesn't work. It's nothing to do with Affinity Publisher, uh, and it would only happen if you're on a Mac. But Apple, for their wisdom, have decided that you can drag and drop from Safari, but not necessarily Chrome or Firefox or Vivaldi or anywhere else that you are. In those circumstances, if you have that kind of situation, so you're, you're, you've, got an, you've got a graphic that you would like in there, then what I do is use like a shelf application, which We've discussed on MacBytes After Hours, so you might want to go and check that out. All a shelf application does is provide you an intermediate holding area from where you can then drag and drop that image. So if you find that when you hover over Affinity Publisher with an image, it won't, it's not there to drop. It's where it's coming from and not where it's going to. So we've got our icons and it's so simple to put these in place, lined up with the grid and then scale them to fit the grid. And if I wanted this one to be much bigger, so it takes up four squares, just scale it to four squares. And obviously, these would not make sense to scale them sideways. So you've got a wide screen, but you could if you wanted to. If you wanted that to distort, you could do that. Now, thing to think about at this point, that's just dragging and dropping. But if you've got a single screen or you're not big into dragging and dropping, then you need to find other ways to do this. So you also have over here a place image tool. And when you click the place image tool, it will take you out to your file system. So I have data in here and I have some posters and I could just choose one of these and click open. It will load it into my cursor. So you see the mouse pointer has completely changed. I've loaded one image into it and now it's twanging nicely to these squares. And when I click, it will just insert that image there. So I will click and it's the center of it is exactly where I was. Now, obviously, this is far too big. So I'm going to need to take this down and get this probably to the to, to the two there. And it's a little bit tall to match, but it's it's two big blocks wide. So that's the other way to do it. Exactly the same thing you can do from file and place. It's exactly the same as the place image tool. It goes out exactly the same location. It remembers the location. Uh, let's choose something bright and bold. Oh, how about that one? That's bright and bold. Uh, you open that again. It loads it into your mouse pointer. You click and it puts that at the center and then you can place that wherever you would like. So drag and drop the place image tool and file place. The other option that you have, let's get a new page, is that you have access to stock images inside Affinity Publisher. So in the stock panel, and if you don't see the stock panel, you need to go to view studio and to make sure that there is a tick next to stock. Uh, I pin mine to the left. It makes more sense to me there than anywhere else. In here, you have access to three stock libraries. So you have Unsplash, Pexels and Pixabay and everything in there can be used free of charge. But be careful with the licensing in terms of it may be good practice if you're going to use something from here to credit the author with it.
So I'll go to Unsplash and I'll look for dogs. Oh, my favourite topic, dogs. Oh, aren't they just too cute? Right. So in here, same principle in a way, drag and drop. And it will drag then drop that image in. Takes a fraction of a second and you'll see this is the copyright information that I was talking about. Oh, the dog's not got a home. That's me gone right now. You can come here and live with us and Lola. Right. But it's very large. So I'm going to scale that down so we can actually get it on the page. There's the dog looking for a home. It's just too sad, isn't it? OK, so that fits neatly, that one, into my squares. So it's three squares tall, two wide. Uh, other thing you can do in here is with the search criteria you've already specified. So in this case, dogs, you can switch from search engines providers without having to retype it. And it will automatically filter the new service for the criteria that you've already specified. Oh, I'm going to need these two white dogs here. So we've got an image from a different one. Now, this one just says who the photos by. It doesn't give you more copyright information. That information is coming from the service in question. OK, let's get that one next to there. And that also doesn't fit bad. Not bad, that. So let's go and do the dog search on Pixabay. And the same principle applies. So that's placing stock images and all of those methods, the drag and drop, the place image tool, the file place, the stock images, all of that gives you an image on a page. Now, you might think, well, yes, obviously it does. Ah, indeed it does. But there are other ways to work with images. So I'm going to go back to the pages and let's create a couple more pages. We'll do another four. And we'll put them after page 29. So they're before the last cover. Oh, they've picked up that, that's, which we don't particularly want, do we? So let's go in here and pick a different one. We should have a very plain one somewhere that we can apply to that. How about the office continuation? That would do nicely. So I'm going to apply that by just dragging and dropping it. So that's a master page applied to it. OK. So, so far, so good. Right. What's the problem with doing things like this? Well, the first thing was we go back over here and we get another stock image. And this time I'm going to be more precise. I'm going to get a Samoid. Oh, they're just so cute. Oh, I'm going to be spoiled for choice. Oh, no. <laughs> let's just find one that looks like my boy. That one will do nicely. So let's put him in. Now, this is where you get a disclaimer in this instance rather than a message. And what it's saying is they're provided by a third party called Pixabay and they're not provided by Serif. So it's up to you to check out the legality and what copyright um, information would need to be attached with the image. So I'm going to say, yes, I understand that and drag the dog on there. Now, that one, uh, not bad, not bad, not too large in terms of some of the others that we brought on were absolutely massive like this. Now, we might want both of these on this page and they are, they're coming in and they're quite large. We have discussed master pages in a previous session. Mike will put the link in. And the master page option is where you create layouts that you can then use within your document. And you might know in hand where you want these images. You may want to have uh, it might be a catalogue of dogs that are available uh, for rehoming. And you might want to say, and I want the dog, you know, at the top of the page. And then underneath that, I'll put the date of birth and I'll put other pertinent information. So you might know that you want the dog there and you would want that dog there. With that scooted down a bit so it fits in. Right. So that's what, where, what you might want. That's where the image frame tool comes in over here. We have the picture frame rectangle tool. And what that is for is it enables you to predetermine where you want to put the images. So if I click that tool and I drag out at the top there, that is giving me a placeholder for my image. And I'll put another one over there. Now, what difference does it make? In some respects, it makes very little difference. But as we start working with it, you'll see it makes a huge difference. So I'm going to grab the same two images and put them in here. Just drag and drop. This time, that's a totally different type of image. I will drag that one over there 
And again, totally different type of image. The difference is once it's selected, you've got extra tools. So if we compare what we're looking at there with the previous page, same image there, there's no extra tools. There's nothing going on in the middle. There's nothing going on underneath it. What you've got here is you have created an image placeholder and having placed the image in it, you've got the ability to work with the image, but it scaled it to the size you wanted it to start with. So if we look back at my document here, all of these were the same size and you can see they're all in these picture frames as well. So it's a good idea when you're making your master pages, if you know where you want the images, then you can put your placeholders in ready. And when you drag and drop the image in, you don't have to rescale it, size it, position it or anything else like that. So the two, the extra tools that you have got in here now are in the middle, you have the move tool. So if I press that, you can see I'm moving the image, but I'm not moving the frame. So if I drop it there, the frame's still in the same place. This big arrow circle of arrows is to move the actual image within the frame. You also have the ability just above that to rotate the image. And again, you are rotating the image. You are not rotating the frame. So you've got your rotate tool there. If you want to get that back, uh, use the shift key and it will twang to certain points. So it will twang to zero. And as you move it around, you can see it's moving in 15 degree increments. And it, you, that way it's predictable for you if you particularly want it upside down. You also have the ability, so particularly with this one where we've got a lot of wasted space over this side. You know, it's all very well to have lovely negative space. But if this is a rehoming catalog, we want to see the dog. So you can zoom in using this scrubber at the bottom and then using that in conjunction with the other tools that you have to move the image within the frame. You've enabled, you've managed to crop out what you don't want, but maintain the size that the image needs to be. Now, you could with an image like this one that's not in a frame. Now, let's put that up there and scale it to the size that we want it, which is about there. You could crop this image, but you would need to use this tool here and that would enable you to crop it. You are actually cropping the entire area, though. You're not doing it where you can say, right, and then I'll scale that up. I could do, but it's going to take me a long time to get it right in terms of, OK, so that's right. Let's now move that there. Now it's far too tall. You know, I can't get the text underneath. So then I'd have to go back to the crop tool and then I'd have to crop it down from the top and then maybe crop it up a bit from the bottom. It's very hit and miss. I can do it there. There it's done. But it's nowhere near as easy as this one where the frame stays still and you manipulate the image inside the frame. That's the power of it. It's pretty amazing that. Right. So we've got our, we've done a placeholder and we've got the difference in terms of it enables you to do a layout before you've got your images, before you've got your text. You can put them on master pages and that way you can apply master pages to pages within your documents and get placeholders for images to be added. So it's, it's one of these tools that once you've mastered this, your document creation will be much, much faster. So we've looked at the move tool, how you can move the images within the frame. You can rotate them and we've done the sliding scale here. But in addition to this type of image frame, so let's go back over here and get even more pages. I think we're going to need more pages, aren't we? Let's put 10 in and let's put them in. I'm going to put them in after 31 and that way it should take the right template. Perfect. Right. You also have, in addition to the rectangle tool, the picture frame rectangle tool, you have an ellipse tool. So clicking that, you get an ellipse for your images. Hold the shift key down and you will get a perfect circle. In relation to the rectangle, yes, it's usually a rectangle. Hold the shift key down, though, and you get a square. So if you're taking images from Instagram or somewhere where they're square, you can do that and keep it in proportion. Good. But 
even more is available. So just to show you that, that this, these are actually working, let's grab some dogs and put the dogs in there. Oh, we've got to have that one in the circle. That's just perfect for the circle. And who can resist a puppy? And there's another one that says all over it, why are you petting me? Now with this one, because the image itself, it centered it, but because the image itself, we can work out with it wider, but obviously we need to bring that down a bit. So you can work with that in there. You also have the ability up on your context sensitive toolbar to decide what kind of fit you want. So this one is saying none, the picture will not be scaled. And it's not. It's showing you the middle and nothing more. But you've also got three other options. You've got the ability to scale to maximum fit. So let's turn that on and see how it gets on with that. It doesn't seem to make that much of a difference in relation to this image. But if we make that a bit bigger, uh, then we can see where we are. So that one, it doesn't make that much difference. But what it should do, maximum fit will fit as much of that image in there as you can get. And also, if you notice, as I'm stretching this out, so if we've got that and it was up there, as I stretch this out, it's not moving it in any kind of way. It's just letting us see more of the image. You also have the other options, which is scale to minimum fit. And what that will do is show you the absolute minimum in there. And then you will have to move that around. So to be honest, I don't make, I don't change this that often. Uh, we don't want to replace it. Hang on back to where we were. There we go. Um, and the last one is stretch to fit, which will make the image fit into the frame that you've got. It will do its best to make it fit into the frame that you've got. And as you move this, you can see now it's not taking away pixels. It's actually scrunching them up because you've said maximum fit fixes fix fit as much of this image into this frame as you can, irrespective of whether it's going to distort it, right? Whereas the other option, so my preferred option, just scale either scale to maximum fit or none at all. And that way I can control it. So when I change the size of the frame, I actually am cropping that image. I'm deciding to lose certain pixels and which pixels I'm going to lose. I, I make that decision rather than leave it to Affinity Publisher. But if you've got strangeness going on in a template that you've downloaded, do check out the properties to see which option you've got on the fit thing that's going on up there. Right, so we've got some more images in there, but now we are moving on because we've got the rectangle tool, which will do squares. We've got the ellipse tool, which will do circles and ellipses. But what if that isn't what you want? Well, we do know that we've got a lot of options for shapes. So there could be, we would like a cloud shape and I would love to put one of the dogs in the cloud shape. And what other shapes have we got? Uh, oh, we've got to have a heart, haven't we, for the, for the dogs? There we go. So these at the moment are just shapes. There are, of course, things that you could potentially do. You might be used to this from some other applications. But if we drag one of these dogs, let's have the one that's in the circle. Right. And I'm not putting it anywhere. I'm just it's not in a frame. It's not. It's the full thing that was downloaded. Right. You may be aware in other applications that you can do that. And what you've just done is take the image and restrict it to the outline of the heart. So how I did that. Let's take that out. There's the image. It sat on top of the heart. Obviously, it would need scaling, but we can do that later. What I do with it is drag it underneath the heart, but over to the right and then drop it. And that masks the image with the shape. The image is still independent in terms of I can scale it and there's the shape behind it and I can put the dog in there and get that just right. So that is one option when it comes to it. But you've still got the issue that you have to manipulate the image independent from the shape. So not perfect. You've also, so I've just closed that up and now I've selected the shape so I can scale the shape and the image will then be scaled with it. But it's not as flexible. It doesn't give you as many options as this does, which is the frame tool, the image frame tools that we've got. But what we can do is right click on any shape and we have an option in there to convert it to a picture frame.
And that puts the cross in it. And when we add an image to it, so let's take this one, it behaves exactly the same as the square, rectangle, ellipse, circle do. It's got in it the ability to move the image. It's got inside it the slider to scale the image. And of course, you could rotate the image. Poor dog. OK, so that was using a shape. So that's particularly useful if you do want to. You see these in magazines. I get a magazine from the Dogs Trust, which is an organisation in the UK uh, that rehomes dogs, a uh, charity. And they have lots of shapes like this with different dog heads in them, even paw prints. And in the main bit of the paw, you'll have one face. And then in, in the little toe bits around it, you'll have three or four more dogs. So this is something that I've seen done for real many, many times. Right. So we've done it with the ellipse, the rectangle, the square, the circle and any shape you like from the shapes. But you can go one further than that and you can actually use the pen tool. So let's build ourselves the most alarming shape that we can think of building and put an image in it. So I click back on the first one to close it. And just so you can see that shape, I'm just going to show you. Let's go in here and make it orange. It is a shape. It does exist as a shape. But you know that I can drag and drop. But what's going to happen? It's going to put it over the top. That's not what we mean, what we need at all. What's going on there? You've got to convert it first, just like with the last one. So click on it, right click on it. And in here, convert to picture frame and then it gets the black cross through it. Now, if you're trying this and it's not working for you, you're looking at it thinking, no, I've not got I've not got the cross in it. You have an option inside Publisher to move to preview mode, which is control and W. And I do mean control and W. Hopefully it's control and W on a PC as well, but I've not checked that. But on a Mac, it is control and W. What that does is get rid of all the grids and the lines to give you a working preview. But the knock on effect of working in preview mode is beautiful and clean. But you're looking at that and thinking, is that a shape or is that a picture frame? And you can't tell. But when you turn your preview mode off, you get the cross through it and you can indeed tell. So let's get rid of him. And let's drag him back in again from over there, hovering over the frame. And there's the dog. Now, in this case, I'm definitely going to need to move, use the move tool to move that down to fill it in. I do have a little bit at the top that isn't working well for this image because the image cuts off there. And if I make the image bigger, obviously we've got the slider, then we lose part of the dog. So oh, it would have been great if that had gone across. But the beauty of this is, of course, that you can actually make that happen because you can edit this. So I could put that there and I could take that there and I could move it down. I've actually edited the picture frame on the fly and now it works perfectly. I can see all of the dog and I've got a nice shape that I can work with. So you can retrospectively go through and edit the frame that these photos are in. Which is, is that's just so good. I'm liking that. Right. Uh, we've done the scaling options. So your other options here. Right. Let's go all the way back to the pages. Right. I know from some of my pages here that I've got layouts where I'm going to want images on the left hand side of the magazine style layout. I don't particularly know where they're going to go. And what I mean by that is if we compare this one on the left with the OneNote one, I've only got three images on the OneNote one and they're in totally different locations than this one is in here. And I think I need that kind of flexibility. I don't necessarily want to make um, a master page which has picture frames in exactly the same place because then the pages are all going to look the same. The level of consistency I want is in terms of I don't want to randomly place these images. I want them restrained really in each of these squares, but I want to decide which squares at the point I'm creating it. There is a way to have the benefit of both, but let's just do the basic one first. So we will go through to one of our pages and I will change the master page that is applied. So we'll use something that's not particularly in your face. 
like a word one. So we'll drag that on there. Well, that's, that's OneDrive. That'll do. It's got over on this. In fact, that's not a good one to use. Do you know why? You can barely see the blue outlines on that one. So maybe the Excel one is probably a good one to use. You can see the blue outlines here. Just inside there is one of the blue squares. Right. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, right, I'm going to need to put my images in it. Where do I want my images? And I go and I use these tools and I think I'm going to have one here. And this is actually snapping, so I don't have to be very precise. I have snapping turned on up in the toolbar and I can put these wherever I want down here like that. And I could draw them out. So I've got double like that. And that's where my images are going to go. Now, all I've got to indicate that these are image placeholders is the cross through them. But if I select them. So I'm using, I'm holding down the shift key and I'm selecting all of those. There's nothing to stop you putting a background in there. So if I put it as white, I can instantly see that that's where the images need to go. Um, traditionally, people tend to use grey. I like a little bit of a lighter grey than that. Just barely grey. So I can see the difference. Right. So these are where my images are going to go. So I'm expecting that there will be four images. Right. I have my image placement tool over here, the place image tool. I have the ability to place the images from the menu as well. So file place. These two tools do exactly the same thing. They will both bring you up this dialog box. And I have some icons in here. So I'm going to choose some of these icons. Right, so let's choose, let's, you know what, let's choose all of them. Let's go crazy and choose them all. We don't have enough image placeholders for these, though. And I don't even know which images I particularly want to use because they're quite tiny, aren't they? But I'm going to load them all anyway, because what it will not do is dump them on the page. It's not going to do that. So if I hit open, it might look like nothing's changed, but if you look on the left hand side of the screen, you have an entirely new panel, place images. And all of the images that I had in that file open dialog have been placed in there, ready for me to work with them, which is fantastic. By default, it's like pick this as the top one and then the second, third, fourth, fifth. As I'm on my page, my mouse pointer has changed. It's loaded the images into my mouse pointer. And I could just click to add one wherever I want it to be. So let's just add it in there. It's a little bit big for that, but I'm going to worry about that later. You'll also see that that one has disappeared from the fi place files, place images dialog over here, the panel. And I'm ready to place the next one just by clicking, click, click, click. And they're pl all placed where I choose to place them. Now, none of those are the right icons. I'm now aware of the fact that none of those are the right icons. Those are the old office icons. They changed in 2019. But my mouse pointer is still loaded and raring to go. And as I hover over these placeholder that we have here, these image placeholders, it's rehearsing for me or previewing for me. Do you want to put this one there? Do you want it there? Do you want it down there? Where do you want it? And I think, do you know what? I think I'll have it there. And as I click on that, it automatically puts it inside the frame. It then reloads the mouse pointer and enables me to do that with the next one and the next one and the next one. That leaves me one left over, which I could just put on the page like all of the others. But I don't particularly need that one. You know, I, I overpicked, didn't I? But if I just switch back to the move tool, that panel completely disappears. It doesn't just bring back the pages panel and sit behind it. It's not there. That is only active when you're actually placing those images. So I don't need all of these, so I can just get rid of them. I didn't even need to place those. I could have skipped past them. This one is slightly different, isn't it? This one has cropped it off. And remember, that's all to do with what you choose up here. What I can actually do, so let's try a stretch to fit. And you see, it does fit, but although it says stretch to fit, it's actually compressed it to fit into the frame. And that's why I don't particular, particularly bother with that. The scale to minimum fit will give you the size of the icon, 
within the frame, irrespective of the fact that the frame is twice as wide as it needs to be for that. So maybe now with these images, more so than photographs, you can see these have a transparent background. Um, so although it is taking up a certain amount of space in there, because it's got a transparent background, you can now understand, hopefully, what the property options actually do. So instead of me playing around and scaling it myself, I can use these properties to force it to scale to the minimum fit or stretch it to fit or maximum fit it, whichever way you want to work. But that one will work nicely for that one. So I shall click done on that. When you click away, it doesn't matter that the frame is twice the width it needs to be. Now, from a design perspective, maybe you need to know enough to know when to break the rules. But the whole point of having the grid was that the images fitted to the grid and now this one's slightly askew, which is pretty simple to move it. It will show you uh, as you move it. So I'm moving the outer frame. It will snap that and you'll see a green line. And that is telling you now that it's lining up with the word one that's above it. So I don't really need to crop this frame if I choose not to. But I can do if I want to, nothing to stop me retrospectively changing that. And then the image will sit bang in the middle. And I know that the outer frame is in just the right place. <laughs> I'm glancing at the chat and I shouldn't because I'll, I'll get sidetracked. OK. So this image, the place images panel is incredibly useful. I use that all the time. You'll find it more useful as you start working and you can predict the layouts because you'll have your image placeholders ready and then you can just boom, 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 boom and fill everything in all at once. That might actually be a good idea if you're trying to concentrate on the actual layout. Don't get hung up on the actual images that you're placing. Leave them as placeholders and add them later. That also has the benefit, not necessarily needed as much these days as it used to be, but many years ago, if you added three graphics, whatever application it was, ground to a halt. So if you don't put the images in, particularly if they're huge photos, until you actually need to, then you can fly through this and you won't have any slowdown while it tries to load an image and think about it. So just a, a couple of options with that. Right. So let's go get our next page here and look at a different type of situation. So it doesn't really matter at this point whether I use the just bung the image on the page option or whether I use a frame to make it actually work. But I'm going to import a PDF. So I'm going to place a PDF, which I can do with the place command or the place tool. It doesn't matter. And I have some PDFs in here, uh, some MacBytes covers. So we've got um, Paddle Powered Pandemonium in the licensing department and playing Scrabble with Big Brother in the Bubble Boutique. I think we'll go for the first one because it's nice and bright. And I'm going to click to add that and put that in place. And is that over? That's perfect. So this is a PDF. And I have just been able to just insert it into here. I don't need to do any magic with it. I just need to put it into here. Now, it is a PDF. You saw that in the Finder. So I'm going to go to the MacBytes stuff in here, bring that across. And there is the file in there. You can see it is a PDF. Which means if I opened it, it would act just like a PDF as you would expect. So I'm going to go into here and do fit page. It's a PDF. If I wanted to edit some of the text, I have edit options in here and I can actually go in and the, these are individual letters that I can edit. So I can edit stuff if it was the wrong show number. I could actually change all of that. So a PDF can be editable. It depends on the app you open it in. But I'm showing you that that one is indeed editable and we have just embedded it in there. I don't actually need to edit it. Normally, when you're editing an element in here, so if we look at this page, once you've got elements on your page, you can move them independently. You can go into here, you can see what's inside it and so forth. But this one just says, well, I'm a PDF. I'm 132 in a PDF. But notice next to it, it says embedded document. So if I double click it, you actually going to open that? You are. There we go. That is now opening that inside Affinity Publisher. So it's a totally separate document. This is my Office Summit document and this is my embedded file, the PDF. 
it doesn't have any master pages. It has one page and you can see it's even got stuff hanging off the edge, which is outside the area that the PDF is locked to. But it's still there to edit it if I needed to edit it, which I don't. But in here, in your layers panel, you've got all of the content. And if you this, this is a big file. <laughs> and it's got lots of elements in it. And there you go. So you scroll down, you've got all of the elements. So if for whatever the reason, there's the panda, you would like the panda to be a different colour. You could indeed get the panda. Shall we find his ears? Where's the panda's ears? Are you an ear? Oh, I can't tell. <laughs> Good grief, is that a foot or an ear? Oh, it's an eye. OK, it's his eye. And there's the other one. You can actually, at this level, come into here and make changes if you want to. So if I wanted to make those grey, you could do that inside a PDF, inside Affinity Publisher. Obviously, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that to the poor panda. So I'm going to come out of that and I've not made any changes at that point. So that's the first point. You can actually edit the PDF inside Affinity Publisher. Now, caveat on that, it does depend on the type of PDF. And what I mean by that is that PDF was created in Affinity Designer. Uh, we could actually see that if you want. We could open up Affinity Designer and try and find where that file is. Hopefully I'll find it. Let's go find it over here first. Let's see if it works. Uh, do my search and see if it works. 132, wasn't it? Let's find that. Come on. You're getting there. I just need the Affinity Designer version of that and then we will definitely be getting somewhere. Maybe I should just open it up in here, see if I can find it from there. So it'd be in my Dropbox. It would be in my... Uh, uh, no, this isn't this isn't organised right. Areas. It would be in MacBytes and with a bit of luck, it's one of the show arts. These are the outputs of the show arts. That's not good. Mm. No, I've probably put it somewhere else. I'll give it one more try. See if it is in where the application stuff lives, which is designer in here. And there's the show art for 135 and 136. It'll have to be one of those that I show you instead then, which is the most exciting of these. Let's open up that one. How I make it is we have the poster at the top. We have the blurred one at the bottom. Sometimes I give you clues. We have the one for the blog and we have a square one. And this one here is for the recording notes. And this one, when it exports, for which you need the export persona, when that one exports, which is not that one, clearly. Uh, why are you saying you're a PNG? You're not a PNG? Uh, maybe you are a PNG. I think I've changed that since, but that would be a PNG and that's how I would, uh, a PDF rather, PDF, a PDF 400 DPI and then I output it and I create a PDF. Because it's come from here, the elements that are inside here are all editable. So in here, the text is separate, the image is separate, the background separate, the Mac bytes is separate, the bubbles are separate, everything's separate. So that works fine when you take it into Affinity Publisher. However, if this was a document that I had scanned, it wouldn't be editable. It would be a single flat layer because it was a scan. So don't rely on the extension of PDF to dictate to you whether something is editable or not. As it happens, this one is editable. Now, the reason that I'm showing you this is this is an embedded document, as we've seen. Um, we should have available up here, which could be because of how I'm working here. But inside where we've got page box and it says trim, you've got alternatives. So there is a media box, which does the same. There is the crop box, which is doing the same, the trim box. But you've also got other types of block, uh, boxes in here. The minimum content, the maximum content. Now, at this point, you are exposing the extra content that you can't even see in the PDF but it is there in the file and the PDF is cropped to one of the boxes, the crop box, the trim box. It's cropped to one of the boxes, but you can in here decide that you want to see more of that if that's what you want to work with. Right. So we'll set that back to the media box. 
Now, the other option you've got in here, and I cannot fathom for the life of me why I am not seeing it. So I'll try this just in case. No, that's not going to work. Um, I have my screen set very, very small. And sometimes that's for demo purposes. Sometimes when I do that, some of the tools disappear and it's looking like some of the tools that I want have disappeared. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. Let me see if I can do it on a right click. So what I'm looking at here, no, it hasn't got the options that I want. So what I was going to show you was that you have the ability to embed a document and determine whether you have PDF pass through enabled or not. Now, I have demonstrated this before. It was in MacBytes after I was 114. So if Mike can go and find that link, that would be good. Um, with PDF pass through enabled, we will see this font. But without PDF pass through enabled, you would not see that font unless you had it installed on your system. So if I didn't have that font, if I handed this off to somebody and they did not have that font, um, you they they would not be seeing that. They would see some kind of random, very plain font instead of what we're seeing there. So just be aware of that. If you put your PDF in there and it doesn't look like you would like it to look, then think about whether it could be to do with the PDF pass through. Let me see if I can find it on the menu. There we go. Right. And it's disabled on that PDF. And I have no idea why it would be enabled on that <laughs> disabled on that PDF. But that's where you will find it. Normally, it is available from this context sensitive menu there. So this one up here, you would see it enabled on there. OK. Right. Let's come out of there then. So how are we doing for questions, Mike? Uh, are there any that are particularly pertinent now while I'm looking at this? Um, one's just coming up. Right, let's have that one then. Mike. Can we place images with a perspective view? Uh, you can, but that's all involved with Studio Link. So, uh, yes, you can, is, is the short answer. You can. Right, I'm moving things over here. Have we got anything else that will be relevant right now? Um, well, let's have a look. No, lots of nice comments. Oh, good. That, that's always good. And Rene nearly didn't make it because he got stuck in a car wash. <laughs> oh, Rene. <laughs> I think that's happened to a lot of people. I remember my dad getting stuck and we were in the car with him. Um, and he had to get out. It kept going. It just kept going through the cycle over and over. We were in there half an hour before he decided that he was going to have to get out um, and, go, and go and tell them in, in wherever it was. Um, so we, we were nice and dry and warm inside the car, but Dad was soaked when he came back. <laughs> Great fun. Right. OK, let's move on from there. Right. Overall, you have the ability to make sure that all of your images are embedded or all of your images are linked, you can change it on a per image basis. So what I mean by that is when you first of all create a new file, you choose the size of it. You choose first of all, whether it's your presets, print ready, it could even be a template, right? But you choose your file size and then you go through and you set your options over here. So over here, it's set to A4, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the point in question here is this one, the image placement policy. I much prefer all of my images to be embedded. And what that does is when I insert an image, it takes a copy of it and it puts it inside the Affinity Publisher file. The alternative to that is to link to images. And what that will do is leave the file where it was when you added it to your file. So when I say leave it where it was, physically it will be in your file system but there'll be a pointer to it in your Affinity Publisher file. Your Affinity Publisher file, because it's linked to it, will be much smaller than if you embedded all of these files. So, but it swings and roundabouts because if you take your Affinity Publisher file and you send it to somebody, they won't see the images. Well, what they will see is a very poor quality copy of the image, but they won't ever see the full quality one because that didn't get sent to them. It's on your file system. The other problem with having images linked 
is wherever they came from is where they still are. And that doesn't mean one folder. It could be in any folder. And trying to relink them again is far too much trouble as far as I'm concerned. So I embed everything. But you can have a very granular control. So I'm going to say prefer linked here and click create. And I've got a basic file and I am going to drag and drop some images into there. So I've got my icons again. So let's grab a few icons, the whole lot and drag and drop. And they are all in there. But these images are not embedded. You can't tell that by looking at them. But if you go into your document and you go to Resource Manager, it will tell you. So in here, you have an entry for each individual image that you've got. It's telling you that the status is OK. In other words, yep, that's there. It's fine. What does that look like if it's not fine? So what if I did that? I've just deleted a file and it says, just a minute, this image has been modified outside of the application manager. So I'm going back into here and it's saying, look, now it's missing. Can't find it. You can still see it here, but it isn't going to be full quality. It's going to be a very rough version of this. In here, you get the opportunity to say, right, well, OK, then uh, I'm going to need to do something with it and you can replace it. So if I had another copy of that icon, so I'm looking which icon it is, I'm going to add a copy of that icon somewhere. And I'm going to say, right, OK, it's missing. I've deleted it. That's why it's missing. If I go to replace and I look at my desktop, there's a copy of it. That's not where it came from. It came from in here in my icons, but I deleted it. There's only one word entry and it's not the right one, but I've got a copy of it on my desktop. So I will open it from there. And now the status is OK and it's linked and everything's fine. It's happy with it. No problem. My problem now is right. OK, I, I know these icons were all in the icons folder. Yes. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying yes, Mike, you're fine. You're fine. Right. So in here, which one is in my original location? Which one's on the desktop? Not a clue. I don't know. So if I send the folder with the icons in it, that word one's going to be missing. So it'll look fine at my end. But when I save this file and I send it to somebody and they open it up, they're going to get a problem with it. It's going to say that file's missing. Right, so let's do that. Uh, emergency Ward 10 outside as usual. Right, there is the icon itself. So what I'm going to do with that one is I'll save this file. So what I've done with that is scoot it down. I'm going to save that file. And I will save it on the desktop. So I'll just put that that is icons. Right. I will then pretend that I have sent it to somebody, but I've sent them the folder of icons. It just didn't have that word icon in it. OK, so I'm going to close that down. So they open that on their end and straight away it says, right, you've got some of these missing. And I say, but I sent you the folder. They're there. When you go into the resources manager, it will say, yep, these are all fine, 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 fine. This one not fine because it was on the desktop. And it's not there now, so it can't find it. What you can do uh, with this one, so let's get down to that. It's telling me, yeah, that was in the desktop. It was on my desktop, but it's not on their desktop. If it was on their desktop, it would be fine. I can click locate in document and that will actually show it to me in the document, but that won't actually help me find it. OK. So I would prefer to embed all that lot. Now, what I will actually do, I will uh, open the trash and in the trash, I've got this icon. So if I do a put back, so put them back where they were, one will be in the icons where it should be and one will be on the desktop where it should be. That will solve the problem with this screaming. But that is showing you the issue. If you look down here, if I do a preview and we look down here, you can see now that this one has not been relinked with its brethren. And look at how poor the quality is by comparison to an image that it can actually find. And that's the issue. The person you've sent it to will see this and not this that you intended them to see. 
Right, so how do I fix this before I send it to somebody? Well, I go into the document and resources manager and I make sure that it can find everything for a start and it can find everything. But what I'm going to do, you do have an option to embed everything. So that's your first option. You could embed all of these. So all you need to do is click embed. That's it. They are now embedded. When I save this file, the file size will be much, much larger. But the images will travel with it. There's no chance of them getting lost. Now, you can convert them back to where they were. So if you're now, you've got this file back from them and you're thinking, I need to make some changes to it. You can make them linked just by hitting the make linked button. So in there, as you click each one, it tells you at the bottom where it is. So down there, that's the file location that that file needs to be in. And as you go through each of these, it will update that and tell you where they need to be. So if we go down to the bottom one, it's linked it back to the one on the desktop. Now, those were the only two options you had until a few weeks ago. You now have another option, which I think is even better. What if you want all of the benefits of having linked files, but you would like to predictably know where they are? So we've seen we've got files linked in here from two different locations. Just for demonstration purposes, I will add in a few more files. So if I add in that MacBytes cover to this file, uh, go on, you can do it. You can. You know you want to. Oh, I should, I should close that first or it'll get very upset. And now that won't close at all. Come on, what are you doing now? I have no error messages anywhere. It's just crashed. <laughs> Unceremoniously crashed. No, nope, you're not going to close, are you? Uh, OK, we will. It won't even quit. Right. We will force it to quit. There we go. Yes. Shall we test how good the recovery is? <laughs> oh, I love live demos. I do. Come on, Affinity Publisher, you can do it. Oh, yeah, I would love to open the recovery file. Thank you very much. Oh, it, it's got permission issues now. This this is cancel or allow, Apple style. Right, it needs permission to, to access this. So I'm going to authorise the folder. It might ask twice. So we'll authorise that folder as well. I could choose to authorise global. This rate is going to be a long time, isn't it? We will authorise the folder. Right, we should be OK at that point. Oh, do you know what? Let's just do the lot. <laughs> Life's too short, isn't it? Right. Uh, in here, in my icons file, then I should be able, although a lot of these are looking a bit dicey now, I should be able to put that file in that I wanted to put in. Let's see if it'll work this time or if it's going to crash it all again. It's not looking good, is it? Certainly not appearing. Never mind. Unless I can see a, di a dialogue box, which I'm not but something's upset it. That's very strange. Uh, can you see it? It's, it's moving things that I'm not moving. And as I'm trying to get in here, everything that I need is dimmed out. So I'm going to have to force that out again. Something's the matter with that. It doesn't like it. So I won't try putting that file in. We will just Work with what we've got while I show you the third option, the fabulous new third option. Uh, yes, open the recovery file because that's the other one. Right. There we go. It seems happier now. Everything is pin sharp. So we'll work with that. We won't fiddle with any more. Right. The third option is in your resource manager. The first option is these are linked. The second one is we'll embed them then. The third option is collect. And collect is the hybrid of the two. We know that our files are in a minimum of two different physical locations. One is on the desktop. The others are in my file structure in Dropbox. I would like to have them linked, but I would like them all to live in the same location. And that's what collect does. As you hit collect, it says, right, where do you want them? I would like them on the desktop. And then I just hit collect. They are still linked. So if we look at them, they are all still linked files. But the one that was on the desktop, it says it's on the desktop. It says it's linked. 
Oh, we've got weirdness going on there in what it's saying, but I have collected them. So that should have worked. Let's have a look what we've got on the desktop. Oh, it's done just the one. OK, we will need to go back into the resource manager, grab the entire lot and collect the entire lot. And we will put them there on the desktop. Now, when we look at them, every single one is pulling in from the same location, which is here. I can do that again in a different way. So I can select them all and then say collect. But this time I'd like to create a new folder. Uh, icons for brochure. So I'm going to create a folder on the desktop. That's I'm inside the folder and then say collect. And now when you look at it, you've managed to move them again, this time into a folder. Now, what it doesn't do, which isn't you wouldn't want it to do this, but it doesn't delete the originals. In this circumstance, I would want the originals to be deleted because I'm not referring to them from there. I assumed it would create a folder and it didn't, but I can delete these because these aren't particularly used. They are coming from icons for brochures. Now, that's where they are. They're linked. They're not embedded. Go back into the resource manager with them all selected and you can again choose to embed them if you want. So these are not restricted in any way. It's not a one way thing. You can go in and make things linked. You can make them embedded. You can collect them all together in a folder and you can do that as many times as you like for asset management. So I really like that that feature that they've added in terms of collecting it. I think that is a really useful feature to have with it. Right. Next thing. Um, editing documents. Now, I said, let's go back over here. I said that you could edit documents and indeed you can. So any of the images that you've got in here, if you particularly want to edit them, you can. Also thinking about if you were doing something like the MacBytes logo or something like that. The way that I work with, with um, logos and repeating elements is I have an assets panel, which we're looking at in a couple of weeks. So what I would do here is drag the stuff on that I wanted from there. So if this is a MacBytes Live episode, we could do that. And I just drag these on. It's very useful to have those available. So I don't really need to edit these things. They're not really editable files. But if you have got a file that you would particularly want to edit, then you've got a few options. So if we go back to our pages and we choose some of these lovely pickies here of the dogs, what you have in here, you actually have the image itself inside the picture frame. So in the layers panel, you have the picture frame and then you have the actual picture. So with that selected, I have the option up here with Studio Link that I'm currently in the publisher persona, but I could easily switch to designer or photo. So if I click on photo, it doesn't look like much has changed, but I am actually now in an entirely different application. This is now Affinity Photo with all of the Affinity Photo tools that we have available over here. So if I particularly wanted to do some dodging and burning or whatever differences, changes I would like to make to that, then I can do that in here. So uh, what shall we do with him? Should we get a brush and, and put some? If only I had some paw prints, but I don't. I will get some of those for next time. So let's put this on here and put some squiggles on it. Right, are you going to let me do that? Have you rasterized that? Uh, let's say rasterize it. Right, can we do this? We are not having much luck on that with that at the moment. Let's put it in there. You are not doing this. What is the matter with you? What have I got set wrong up here? <gasps> Certainly have something wrong. Let's go. Oh, no, it's there. It's there, but I'm not seeing it. It's probably behind it. Oh, what's going on there? Weirdness is going on there. That's the answer. Uh. <laughs> the hand is freaking people out. Disembodied body parts are not good, are they, in a demo? We, we could scoot that down. But in essence, anything that you would want to do in Affinity Photo, you can do with the studio link and just flick over to it and then start working with it. So and to flick back, go back over here. Now, that works really well when you've got something like a logo that's placed. So what did I have open in? Let's open Affinity Designer and I will 
create something that we will then bring into here and then we will edit it. So at the moment, I am completely outside of Affinity Publisher. But I'm going to create a new document in here. Let's get that set up. We'll have it that size so I've got some kind of perspective to it. So let's say I decide in here that we will use my branding for photo and we will just put some squares and things in it. Nothing exciting. It's, it's the principle we're looking at and not exactly what we're doing with it. So I will save that file. At this point, remember, I'll put it on the desktop. It is an Affinity Designer file and it's totally independent. So we'll put there, we will call that poster is what we will do on the desktop. Close down Affinity Designer. Then inside Affinity Publisher, I would like to put that poster in there. Well, we know that we've got lots of different ways of doing that. We have the image place for a start. So I will go to the desktop. There is my poster. And despite the fact it's an Affinity Designer file, it is going to let me place it inside Affinity Publisher. I'm going to open that up. And we'll have that in there. So there it is. You can see it's got a uh, transparent background on it because I didn't specify a background. But there is my poster. I'm going to put that there. Now, instead of having to go out and edit that outside of Affinity Publisher, which means you know what you like when you like switching from application to application, you don't need to do that. You can go into Designer. When you go into Designer, you've even got the assets. So, you know, I forgot to put Wolfie on it. I can bring Wolfie in there. Now, at this stage, you'll notice that something is actually happening there. I've switched and I can put the wolf on it. I can edit this. But what is it I'm editing? And this is when you have to be very careful. You're not editing that Affinity Designer file yet, despite the fact you have switched with Studio Link to be in Designer. How do you know? Well, the wolf is here sitting with the master page and the poster, the AF design file, is embedded and I'm not actually in there yet. So if I take Wolfie and I double click in here, now I'm actually editing that file. So I can put Wolfie in here. Let's swap Wolfie for that and have him over there. That looks grand. Save that and then close down the embedded file. And when I get taken back, Wolfie is now inside the designer file. So the only thing to be careful of when you're using Studio Link and switching between them is make sure when you the first time you switch from app to app, you're actually editing the Affinity Publisher file. If you want to be editing inside the file that is inside this gets complicated, doesn't it? You're editing inside the file that's inside your publisher file. You need to double click it first to edit it. But other than that, it works brilliantly. Now, Studio Link, for it to work, you do actually need all the other applications. So if you've only got publisher, then these won't be available for you. So if you but if you've got all three, you can switch between the three of them seamlessly. This is something Adobe were working on for quite a while, but Affinity beat them to it and it works really well. Right. Other things to think about. So what we've done so far in here. So I'm going to get back to publisher so I can see all of the pages is formatting these things. So we know that these are both image frames that we have and we have the option to change the frames on these. other thing to think about is where do you want these? So all of these at the moment, I'm moving them around on the actual pages of content that I have. But I specifically said this could be a catalogue of dogs looking for rehoming. And I know I've got 12 in at the moment. So wouldn't it be good if I had a master page that had the graphics frame there, that had that picture frame there ready for me to drag and drop into? That would be good. And that you can actually do. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to go to the to the one of these master pages. So we've got this one. I'm going to duplicate it. We should put it underneath and I'm going to go in there. And I am going to edit that, the spread properties, which will give me an option at the top to put dogs for rehoming. 
Right. I don't need that particular thing on it and I don't need that on it, but I'm quite happy to have the sidebars on it. Right. I now need to put a frame there and make it ready for the image. And that couldn't be easier. You just do exactly as you would do on a standard page. But you will notice something has happened. What's going on here? There is some orange thing happening. That is actually formatting on the frame. So what I mean by that is in here, we dragged and dropped some images and stuff. Or we mustn't use the hand one, mustn't we? It's freaky big for that. There we go. There's just the dog. Right. In here, we didn't put any anything magical on it, but we could have done. So we don't have a stroke at the moment. But if we decide that we are going to put a stroke on it, like a lovely green stroke, we can. But if we'd like that on every single frame, oh, now we've got to copy and paste and do clever things with styles and stuff. That is why on the master, you could set it up on the master. So instead of having it gold, we could have it the green one. We want it green we Want it quite a deepish green, like not, not a garish green like that. That'll do. So now we've got a picture frame and I want that picture frame on the other side as well. So I can copy that and paste it. That gives me two or I can use the option key. And now it's on the master. Right. When I go down to one of my pages in here and I apply the master to that page, I get my placeholders here. When I go over to my stock and we look up Samoid again. Oh, just too cute. Seriously cute. Drag and drop that on. It will take a little bit of time as it downloads, but it's downloaded it. That one looks perfect. Perfect. And we'll have this one who's looking at the other one. It takes a fraction of a second because it's downloading quite um, large files. So it's thinking about it for a second, but it will get there. There we go. And they are laid out absolutely perfectly. Let's go to a preview. So we lose all of the lines here and there's our images in our frame. The beauty of this is when we go back to our pages, uh, if we add in some more pages, so let's add in another 10 pages. One more, right? And on these pages, you can see we've got the frames already. So whether there's any photos in them or not, we've got them all already and we decide we don't like the green. We would like the frame to match what's going on over here. So first of all, I'll put a couple more uh, images in there. Let's go in here. Let's add that one. And oh, you've got to have one where they're asleep. And again, it's taking a couple of seconds because it's actually downloading that and they are big files. There we go. Right. So back in our pages, we've now got four pages, four pictures on two pages, and we've got a whole range of extra pages where the frame is green and we actually would prefer it now to be red. But now it's on the master. All we actually need to do is to select the frames that have got green that we don't particularly want. And in our colours here, there is our green and we would like that to be the same colour that this is at the side. And we just need to do that instantly. The second we did that, all of these pages that have got these either the images on them or the placeholders on them update automatically. While we are at this, just in terms of uh, styling images or styling the frames of where you place your images, if we go back into the master and we go back into one of the frames, you do have the ability to change the corners. So you could have the corners rounded, you could have them straight, you could have them concave, you could do anything like that. And you could do that to all of them. Now, which, which one's the least offensive? Probably that one. <laughs> Probably that one. Right. You also have the option here where it says single radius. Single radius means that all the corners are the same, but they don't have to be. So if I wanted the, this corner down here to look like that, but I didn't want the others to look like that, then all I need to do is to go up here and say none on that one. Uh, which one are you? None on that one. And I think indeed it's none on that one. Oh, it's not. OK, let's take that back to concave. It must be this one over here. It's so annoying. It doesn't actually look like they're in the right place. No, we don't want it round either, but we could if we wanted to, could have four different corners. Right. And the thing with that is you've done it on the master. 
So as you go through to your images, now they've all got a space in the corner, maybe for the dog's name or a little logo or something like that. And doing it on the master page, and again, there is a session dedicated to master pages um, that, that Mike will put the link in for, um, fastest way to do it. You can change the colours, you can change the styles, you can change the whole lot with it. Absolutely love doing that. But if you do just want it on one, so say on this dog here, so we haven't done anything on that one, but you would like it done on that. Don't think that you can come through to here and do that. Not without unlocking it, you can't. Because these are coming from the master pages. So it can be done, but you would have to detach it from the master and then make a single change. So think about the difference. Make the change on the individual page for a single frame. Make the change on the master pages for multiple frames. Right, let's go back to the early pages on here. Let's go back to, oh, PowerPoint, my beloved PowerPoint. Used to be my beloved keynote, but it's now my beloved PowerPoint. Right. These are images placed in image frames. And this is text. It's placeholder text, but it's text nevertheless. So let's imagine that I would like when I produce this file. So, th so this, is, this is the secret source bonus. OK. You probably... A good proportion of you will already know that if you go into the here and you want to put make that a hyperlink, you can do that because you go to text, you go down to interactive and you choose insert hyperlink and then you put in a hyperlink. So I'm just going to put my blog. Uh, character style is, is a hyperlink, which means it will turn blue and underlined. Not very pretty, but gets the job done. When I produce that to a PDF, it will be clickable. We'll be able to do that. Let's do that now and prove the point. Right. I'm going to ignore any pre-flight problems. I'm expecting pre-flight problems. Right. You're going to output a PDF. And many of you just think, yep, PDF, fine. Da, da, da. And you do it. You do need to think whether you want the current spread, all the pages, the current page. But let's say you wanted all of the pages. Then you're going to dash and you're going to hit export. Don't do that. Because the most important thing that's in here beyond what you actually want to produce to PDF is this option at the top, which is the preset. You have different presets for PDF. As I said, not all PDFs are the same. You're very tempted because you want best quality to say, oh, yes, for print. That way it'll look fabulous or press ready. But there's a huge thing going on here, which is, let's say I'm going, uh, uh, yes, I want it for print. I'm not actually going to print it. I want PDF to view on the screen, but I want the best quality. So I'm going to go for print. This is where you will cause yourself a problem. Because if you go into more and you look at what that will actually do. So you need to wade through that to know exactly what that will do. So it will downsize anything, downsample anything above 375. It will set a document resolution. It will allow compression. Keep going, keep going. It will embed the profiles. It will do all of this stuff here. Oh, just a minute. What's that? There's not a tick in include hyperlinks because it's for print. And unless I've fallen asleep for 20 years and you can now click a piece of paper, that's not going to work. So they don't allow the hyperlinks to be included, which when you understand it makes total sense. But until you understand it, you're like, M my hyperlinks aren't working. So just to show you, if you go into the digital ones, either small size, high quality, let's try the high quality. By default, when you go into the more, it, the hyperlinks are already included. There's a tick in the box. That trips so many people up. I saw at least three questions about it in a forum the other day. And I thought, I just wish that they would tell you like a big flashing box here. Your hyperlinks won't be clickable. Right. But in, in any digital output, so digital, small, digital, large, just check. You can use any of these you like. You can turn them on. You can turn on the make the hyperlinks active, but just check that it is actually got a tick in the box before you produce it. We've put a tick in the box. We know that that's right. It's going on the desktop. We want to make sure that that PowerPoint magic video does actually link out to my blog. This is going to take maybe 20 seconds or so because there are so many pages now. 
but it will get there. I promise you it will get there. So when it's finished, I will open up the PDF in my PDF reader, which happens to be PDF Expert. But any PDF reader that supports that will work just fine. So as long as you can click links in it, it will work just fine. So let's move this fractionally sideways. It should appear over here when it's done any second now and I will open it. We will go find the PowerPoint page. Where's the PowerPoint page? There it is. And you can see for a start, when you hover over it, you get the hand. When you click it, it's a link. And did that actually open? Yes, it did. There it is. Right. So far, so good. Next question. And for years and years, there had to be a dirty hack for this. What if I wanted that image to be a hyperlink? Mm. So you think to yourself, well, I can't go to text, you know, clues in the name, text and say interactive content, insert a hyperlink because it's not text. But you can. Unbelievably, you can. So if I put my blog back in there again and I click OK, this time I'll save that first. But this time when I go to export it and we're continuing to ignore that, I'm going to say just the current spread. I'm using high quality so the links are actually available. But if you need to check, remember, it's on the more. Just look at the bottom. Make sure you include the hyperlinks. And I'm going to export that and we will stick that on the desktop too, which shouldn't take half as long. In fact, I think it's already done. There it is. So I'll open that up. This one should still be active and work because we've got the hand. Now, as we hover over these images, nothing on these, but that one, no indication until you hover over it. But you click it and guess what? And there it is. And it did work because it's open twice. I was sat there thinking, how would I get a link on an image? And I thought, we'll just try the text one. Why not? <laughs> the only caveat with this I've found so far, and I must admit, I've not spent that long looking, is I was thinking, right, so over here with this one, I can go into that and I can edit it. All right, so I can get into here and there would be a link on there. So I'm thinking, right, OK, over here, how do I get to the link? How do I get to the link on there? And I thought, well, I could go back in into the interactive. Um, I do get the opportunity to edit that link. So it, it's not obvious it's on the text menu, but it works. The reason it's on the text menu is it was added as an afterthought. When Affinity created Affinity Publisher, they intended it for printed documents. They did not intend it for web distributed PDFs with links in it or ebooks. The first thing I had when I set my sights on, on the first beta, I opened it and I thought, where's, where's the add links? And there was no ability to add links. So I got in touch with them and I explained the scenario and said, I'm not going to be able to use it. I'm going to have to use Keynote until I can add a link. The added links were added about three to four weeks later in the very early beta stages. And they put it on the text menu. Although it works with graphics, it's still on the text menu, which I think it'd be nice to have an interactive menu with all of the interactive options, maybe down the line. But that is where it is for now. And now, you know, the secret source to get to it. Oh, right. Let's go in here. And are we contemplating moving at all today? Oh, we are. Let's have a recap of everything we did. We looked at standard images where you drag and drop them and they just go on the desktop. We looked at image frames and then image placeholders, which gave us so many more options where we had scaling options. There was the place images panel where multiple files could be put in a holding area and you were able to drag and drop them on and put them in either in an image placeholder or just standard on the page. There was the PDF pass through. And then we had our image placement policy. Oh, we had fun with that. You can link, you can embed and you've got the new option, which is to collect everything together and put it in one place. Then there was all the options to edit the embedded images, which could be any kind of image. It doesn't matter. It could be a PDF that you've put in there. It could be a 
PNG, a JPEG, doesn't matter. You can edit those images. You have Studio Link to hand off to the other applications within the Adobe Suite, the Affinity Suite. Um, what else is that? Um, yes, our secret source. Our secret source is adding links to pictures, which is something that people want to do. But it's certainly not obvious how you actually do it. Right, Mad May. That's when we're going live every Sunday and on demand. This show will be available on demand as soon as we have pressed stop. Next week, we are looking at mastering text styles in Affinity Publisher. So it's the 16th of May, three o'clock, which unfortunately is 7 a.m. Pacific time. Sorry about that. <laughs> and 10 a.m. Eastern time. I didn't manage to squeeze it on that one, but it's uh, 4 p.m. Central European time. The week after that, we are creating and managing assets in Affinity Publisher. So that's the 23rd. And the week after that is a build with me. Haven't decided what yet, but it's a build with me. So what uh, this was discussed last week, and it's basically a project taken from the, the initial concept to complete, from concept to complete. Last week, we looked at Deep Diving Data Merge in Affinity Publisher, which is available on demand. All of the timestamps are available underneath, so you can go to exactly the part that you're looking for. And previously, and still available, are all the things we did uh, about six weeks ago, which is mastering the export persona in Affinity Designer are most requested. Then we did mastering blend modes in Affinity Photo. Had great fun with that. Still the most viewed is create creative tables in Affinity Publisher, which surprised me, but it's there and people seem to love it. Also, we did mastering master pages. So we've looked at a little bit to do with master pages today. Um, but that deep dive master pages, everything you needed to know about master pages was there. And we wrapped up that one with Bridge, Adobe Bridge, all of which is available on demand at youtube.com slash Elaine Giles. If you subscribe, you will get notifications of all of that. Uh, also, there is the notification bell. If you hit the notification bell, they will let you know when we're going live and when a new video is produced. Right. I have been Elaine Giles. I know most of you do know me, but if you want to get in touch with me, you can get in touch with me any of those methods. Although, to be perfectly honest with you, mm, possibly the blog is the best bet and use the contact form because Facebook, I'm terrible with Facebook, can't find a thing and I'm not much better with LinkedIn. <laughs> but you can contact me any of those ways. We, of course, love you guys. And if you have found anything useful today, do let us know by giving us a like because it really makes a difference. If you would like first information on all that we do here, you could go to elainegiles.com slash VIP, where you will find everything that we have done. You will also get notifications of upcoming sessions, including reminders for these sessions. Uh, and, and you can also reply to when I ask what sessions you would like to see. So it's a good way to get your point across in terms of what sessions you would like to see. So. We are now going to head straight into a Q&A. So, Mike, you've been collecting questions, haven't you? I've been collecting questions. So I'm going to go and find said questions. And comments. And comments. Questions and comments. Questions okay. and comments. I'm, I'm, I'm fast finding it. I am. I am in there. Right. Bridge, data merge. Hang on. What order are these in? There we go. Working with images. Right. Let's have a look. Hello, Zorba Press. With stock images, say from Unsplash, is there an easy way to learn if the images is uh, 300 dpi or higher pixels per inch? It usually tells you when you, in, when you um, insert it. The little float over comes up and gives you the information on it. So you should find that there. Kim, does, does using the placeholder make the file larger than cropping the photo? Well, when you crop the photo, the photo is all still there anyway, because you can uncrop it. So, no, um, it's not going to impact your file size at all. I would say if file size is a massive, massive problem, then use linked images because you've got much more granular control of the linked images now. You can control them um, in such a way that you can embed them. You can link them. You can switch between embedding and linking them. And you can also use that collect thing. So you could link them and use collect 
and that would make your actual file smaller while you're working with it. Personal, personally speaking, I would still at the end of it create an embedded version and be done with it. Just belt and braces. But I'm the type of person that when I am sorting out a presentation at the end of a presentation, I, al <laughs> I also make a PDF copy and I make a copy in, in terms of images, just in case. Uh, has that been necessary? Yeah, Apple broke Keynote. I don't know they break something constantly, to be honest. But they broke Keynote in such a way that the new version could not open the old version's files. I don't think for one moment Affinity are going to do that. I don't. But just in case they did, <laughs> just in case something happened, uh, if you've got a PDF copy of it outside of it, you've got images outside of it, just as, be as flexible as you possibly can when you're saving your stuff. Right. Can you change a shape you create from scratch into a picture frame? Yes, you can. And I showed you that. OK, hopefully that's helpful, Tracy. Um, answered that one from Daniel. Right. Um, can you import serif page plus files? No, no, Carol. <laughs> We had a big discussion about that. Yeah, in the that chat. is something that um, they have been apprised that that does not please people. Let's just put it like that. I think their logic is they need to work forward with this plan and not backwards, trying to support older technology. But if you have used Serif Page Plus, I can imagine that that's very frustrating. But no. Is the 300 DPI embedded PDF enough for high quality magazine printing or are there original files that need to be sent? Um, 300 DPI embedded PDF should be fine unless you need it, particularly at 600 DPI or 400 DPI. The best bet you can do with that is get the from your printer. They should have some guidelines that they're working to. Now, we found when we, we had we didn't produce much for print until about two years ago. And then we got a printer, a printer in terms of a print service. And we needed at that point to be able to print stuff out and it work first time. And all the instructions were for InDesign. It was infuriating. But there should be some information from the print service as to what they actually expect. If they particularly specify that it's got to be a certain DPI, then switch it out for that DPI. But other than that, uh, I've printed stuff at 300 DPI and it's been absolutely fine. Uh, we've had professionally printed stuff back like brochures, programs for things, and it's been fine. Uh, but personally speaking, I might push that a little bit higher than 300. But it should be all right. Right. Um, I think I answered that one too, Kim. Does the collect option take them out of the original folder? No, it doesn't. It makes a new copy and links the image in the document to that new copy. But because you've still got the option to embed it, you could then switch from collected to em which is linked to embedded and then do a collected again and it would export those to another new location. But no, all of your original files are completely safe with that. With styles, did you do you look into Scrivener styles bringing over to Publisher? I have and it does. I actually have a full course available on Udemy all about Scrivener styles. And yes, because the way that Scrivener works is to get something out of Scrivener, you need to compile it. I think we talked about doing some kind of compile, didn't we? A session on compile. Mm. Um, you compile it from Scrivener into another format. There is no such concept of a text file format dedicated to Affinity Publisher. But you can export from Scrivener to either a Word file, a docx, or an RTF file, a rich text format file, and they include styles. I would stick with Word myself just to be sure. But the Word file will have styles into it, in it. And when you import that into Publisher, it recognises those styles and imports them into the styles panel. Uh, talking of which, we're looking at styles next week, aren't we? Styles next week. I think Textiles, it is. I think Textiles. Next week, isn't so it? I will include that in there, Mike. Make a note of that. I will include in it how you take something from Scrivener. 
to publisher with styles. Oh, this is going to be exciting next week, isn't it? Right, I'll just put a tick in that box. OK, I am moving on now to uh, comments. So Pentacon 6 expert, I'm liking that. That is a good handle. I learned a lot from the Mastering Affinity Publisher Masters Master pages in March. Was able to start and complete a book thanks to the training session. Now awaiting the return of the book from the publishers. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, I would love to see a picky. Take a picky of the book. That would be great. Now, Zorba Press says, I'm here because I thought we should work with Images in Affinity Photo and then use the Images in Affinity Publisher. I want to learn why I'm mistaken. I wouldn't necessarily say you're mistaken, which is what Paul says. Uh, this session was about working with images inside Publisher, but that includes if you need to edit an image, then you can take it out to photo and actually do the editing in photo without having to go back to the original, edit it in photo and then delete the thing from publisher and bring it back in. It's just this linking way of working. It's a linked way of working. Um, Pentacon 6 experts says seeing some of these tutorials a second time can also be very helpful. Oh, indeed. That's why we provide the email with the links in it that link you to the specific places. So it, they've got timestamps in them and you can just click on the timestamp and get to that, that point exactly. Oh, Carol says that's very useful to know. I lost the original of my ebook and only have it in PDF and wanted to update it. Well, there you go. You don't even need, depending on the level of editing you need, Carol, uh, you could edit that in something like PDF Expert. But if you want to make more changes to it and, and basically create a new version, a new master, then I would bring it in here and, and do that. Ah, oh, this is very helpful. Thank you very much, Pentacon 6 Expert. Renee, stuck in a car wash. That's a classic. <laughs> That's a classic. How did you escape? Ah. <laughs> oh. Tracy had never seen the properties for image placeholders. Always learn something new with Elaine. Oh, that's good, Tracy. That's good. And then, oh, convert to picture frame. Another discovery. I would say discovery is the biggest problem with these apps. It's like, how does that work? I wonder if it could do X. I mean, how do I put a link on an image? Ah, you go to the text menu because, you know, that's obvious, isn't it? Mmm. <laughs> Things are hidden. <laughs> Oh, dear, I'm loving that. The pen tool. I'm so, so bad words were said with the pen tool. The pen tool is a nightmare, I'll grant you. I've been using pen tools so long that, that I'm not phased by them anymore. I also have my own way of working with them and it works. So I'm happy with it. But this business of like where you just draw and drag and, you know, magic happens. No, I'm not at that level with the pen tool. No, it still does its own thing. There you go. <laughs> Ah, oh, right. Renee. Renee says Elaine Giles was genius like always. Oh, you're very welcome, Renee. Hope you found it useful. And Kay says, thank you for helping me to use the software better. You are very welcome. Kim says, Elaine, you're genius as always. And thank you to Mike. Yes, thank you very much, Mike, for, for holding the fort over there. So Kim loved the show and liked the tutorials. That's fantastic. Do we have any more questions? Uh, let's have a look. Oh, Kim likes the collect feature. The collect is such a good addition. Such a good addition. And I saw that and I thought, oh, yes, yes, because I didn't like the linking just in case they were in different places. I have another application that does exactly the same and working with it is a nightmare. And it's Wirecast that we use to broadcast the show. And you can drag posters into it, as you can see. We have posters there right now. But it drags them in from its current location. And I always have to remember it's got no collect option, nothing like that. I always have to remember to put it in the right folder before I drag it in. If I don't, the next time I open it, it says can't find it. Don't know where it is. No, no. And then I've got to go and find it, you know, two minutes before I'm going live. So that collect option is like, oh, my life is now complete. I can link, I can embed and I can switch between them. Love it. Right. Uh, uh, yes, a very happy Mother's Day to all the American mummies, including a fur babies, obviously. It's strange that it, it's six weeks after ours. I don't know why. We are Father's Day in June. Maybe that's why. Ah, Zorba Press says, understand now this method gives us the best of both worlds, working with images in Affinity Publisher when we can. Exactly. It's just if you need to. You know, if you are a photographer and you're processing your images inside photo and at that point you're not thinking about laying them out in a photo book, then carry on doing that. But 
if you've got your photos in there and suddenly decide that you know what i think that'd look better in black and white you could actually do it from inside publisher so that's just a faster way of working but completely up to you how you work it's just an option Tracy says last week's session on data merge allowed me to successfully produce and send a whole mail shot with personalized letters and address labels oh that's fantastic tracy uh, thank you elaine you are very welcome very welcome and for peter every day is a school day but in a good uh, in a good way of course. Oh, uh, Karen says, how do I sign up for VIP? The link didn't work. I'm What's just, the matter? just sent her another link. What happened with that? OK, all being sorted out. Uh, oh, is it because the Elaine Giles is being highlighted? Shall I try it? Let's see what happens when I click it. It got there, I think. Uh, yes, it got there. So let, let us know if that was successful. Right, well, i get back into here. Uh Kim liked the collect photo. Oh, hang on, we've already done that bit. It's moved, it's moved down. Right. Um, Wayne was late, even though I had a reminder. Well, it's all right to be available on catch-up. And Dee is looking forward to being marooned. Only late by 100 minutes. <laughs> that takes some doing, Wayne, but don't worry, we're, we're wrapping up. But you can always, you can always wind it back as well. Um, there is a feature on YouTube that, that you can put a tick in a box for which I think is called something stupid like instant replay or something. But it's like a, a DVR where you can wind it back. So you can actually wind it back to the beginning right now and carry on watching. Obviously, you'd miss the chat then. It would make no sense. But the option's there. Uh, <laughs> Tracy makes no distinction as to whether your children have fur or skin. <laughs> Glad to hear it, Tracy. <laughs> so many people think we're weird when we say our daughter or our son. Yeah, well, what can I say? Of course she is. She's adorable. Uh, oh, Carol wanted to replace some of the photos in the ebook. Um, you probably could still do that in certain applications like PDF Expert, but I think the best way to do it is to bring it into. How many pages are we talking about? Um, the best way to do it is probably to open the PDF and then save the file as a, an Affinity Publisher file and then start the changes. Now, remember that initially the, the PDF file is going to be embedded. So what you might want to do is go into the embedded file and take things like the pictures out of the way. And then that will give you, when you go back to the publisher file, like places for you to put an image placeholder in and then add the images as and when needed. And don't lose the originals for the future. <laughs> but that happens so often. I know that. Uh, my problem is, is usually where I've got like a presentation. I had a presentation that went back to 2004 and it was in PowerPoint format, I think. And at some point I'd converted it to a keynote file and then the keynote file wouldn't open and I didn't have the um, PowerPoint file. But luckily at that point, keynote fixed itself. And that's why I have this process post an event be it a MacBytes After Hours or a presentation like this or a training session, that I always take the, the slides out as images and a PDF. The PDF will give me the best way to potentially edit that should Keynote or PowerPoint not be there in the future or not be compatible with the file that I've got. So at least I can see the slides. Most of the time, that's all I need. Um, I'd be quite happy to... to rebuild the slides if need be. So if we think about some of the slides that we've had today, what have we had on here today? Uh, let's say something like that one. That would be easy enough to recreate. I wouldn't particularly need that slide. I could easily recreate that. I could easily recreate all of these. But I'd need to be able to see them to see what was on them. What did they actually say? Uh, rather than go and refine that information. So it's enough for me to just be able to see them. And a PDF will give me a guaranteed way to see them. And if I've created PNGs of them as well, that will give me a guaranteed way to see them. So I'm happy to just see them. But the PDF would give me an opportunity to deliver it uh, in a circumstance where PowerPoint's not working or I don't have access to it. So there have been times I've actually been an attendee at an event. Uh, there was one in particular, the guy was talking about, I think it was the Titanic, and it was fascinating. But he brought his um, presentation that he wanted. Um, now, let me think. Why couldn't he get that on there? Yeah, he had the PowerPoint on a pen drive. 
And the guy with the laptop, because it wasn't this guy's laptop, so he had the pen drive, the other guy had a laptop, which was a MacBook Air, which sat there looking at the pen drive saying, ha, that's not happening. So he couldn't actually plug it in there. But he did have a PDF that was in a cloud somewhere. So I said, ping me the PDF and I'll present the slides from my phone and you just strut your stuff. I didn't even have an iPad with me. So because he had a PDF version before he delivered the slides, the PDF we could just throw to the screen and it, it didn't matter that it wasn't PowerPoint or whatever. So uh, I call it the presentation life cycle and it's all the things you should do and the times you should do it when you're working with presentations because I've been doing that for 30 years and I know all the pitfalls. I've probably suffered through most of them. <laughs> uh. Oh, Betamax. I, I remember Betamax. And Tracy <laughs> rewinds all the time. We know Tracy and Tracy's incredibly brave. She watches it two times as well, which I think there should be a law against. But <laughs> yeah, DVR is, is playing it on demand. 68 pages. That's not too bad, I guess. It, it, it could be worse. It could be 500. I reckon you'd be OK doing that. Uh, hello, Andrea. Andrea's, Andrea's late as well. Oh, no. But hello. It'll be available on demand. And Wayne will be watching it with you. <laughs> oh, someone said they've childhood memories of watching a certain event in 2013 and I felt so old. Do you know, I think that with Live Aid, I just assume everybody's seen Live Aid. And then when Jonathan said... Johnny wasn't even around. Johnny was minus four at the time. And I thought, oh... Right. I think it was when somebody said we studied we studied Live Aid in history at school. I thought, history? It's not history, it's current affairs. <laughs> but no, I've got to face facts. <laughs> I'm older than I think I am. <laughs> there you go. Oh. And Karen says, whenever I need to learn something about affinity, you've got all three. I'm the person you seek out. Hey, that is good. That is good. I try to make it practical in terms of like, the things that you actually want to do with it and not going through it's got this feature and this feature and this feature and this feature you're like yes but i'm not going to use 90 percent of those how do i put a link on an image it's those kind of things so hopefully that is for you find that useful do i have the life cycle in a document um no i don't yet carol um i have delivered it a couple of times but not actually documented it that's not good is it uh i'll i'll sort that out I'll, I, that might be a good session to do Oh, and Kim's agreeing with Karen, says, couldn't agree more, Elaine is the best. Thank you. Thank you both, ladies. Much, much appreciated. And Tracy, only two times when she wants to catch up <laughs> to understand the comments and ask questions. <laughs> when she rewatches, I'm at normal speed. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. You might be able to get me up to 125, but I think two is pushing it a bit. <laughs> Sorry, D. They, they studied Live Aid in history, didn't need to hear that. Neither did I. It was shocking. It was shocking. Another one was, um, you remember that school we went to, that teacher that you know, and he had pictures all over his classroom of computer stuff from the 80s. And I was loving it. I thought, oh, this is amazing. What a classroom. But isn't he a history teacher? Yes, yeah. Yeah. So these things that I were thinking are like, oh, I remember that like it was yesterday. They were history. It was the history of computing, and I thought, oh dear, now I do feel old, but never mind. <laughs> oh, oh, Tracy's got wall to wall sunshine. Um, we've got grottiness. We've got wall to wall cloud. So you go and enjoy yourself. <laughs> oh, and Tracy wants uh, the pr presentation life cycle. Put that down, Mike. Put that down. Right, okay, then I will give you a last call for questions uh, before we head off uh, and, and come back next week for uh, what we're doing next week. Which is textiles, which is good. Textiles is very good. Like textiles. They can be a bit finickety. Oh, hello. Have you woken up? <laughs> she says she's the, she's the prettiest Samoyed and she needs to be in the presentation. <laughs> and she's letting me know very vocally. So uh, textiles can be a bit confusing. But once you've got the hang of them, they're an absolute doddle. They are, aren't they, Lola? Tell them how easy they are. Do you think that's Lola for where's my dinner? It's five to five and I'm looking for my dinner. <laughs> Either that or a walk, one or the other. Sweet. <laughs> oh. Sweet. Right, um, I've got to stop these history stories. <laughs> I'm ruining Dee's bubble of denial. Can I move into your bubble of denial with you? I'm still 21. I am. 
Uh. <laughs> Loving this about Elvis who? Oh, good grief. Not good. Not good. Right, what training do I do? Uh, hang on, which training do you go over colouring different file types? For example, can, can you colour PDFs? Oh, give me more information on that, Karen. Ping me a mail and tell me precisely what you're trying to do with it. Uh, see, now Carol did that uh, with a problem she was having and I've sorted that out. So all we need to do is make sure um, that we get that to Carol. Should we do that as a demo? Oh, it was very interesting. Very interesting. Glad you enjoyed it, Debbie. I do have a Samoid. You need pictures. OK. Um, where have we got a picture of Lola? Oh, we usually have a picture of Lola. Lots of pictures of Lola in the... Um, week at Matt Bites headquarters. The week at Matt Bites headquarters. So what I can do... Let's get rid of that. And let's open up Bridge. I don't know where Bridge will open up. It'll open up at some point. And there must be a picture of Lola midweek. Oh, yes, there was Lola. Oh, she was so dinky. Right, uh, let's have a look at some of these. Bring it on here. There she was, resting her little self. That was this week. She looks like a little curled up fox there, doesn't You're she? You're now being talked about. Yeah, she's being talked about, Lola. Oh, and she went polling. She went, you know, the dogs at polling station thing. She went polling, but she didn't enjoy it. So there is there is another one of her somewhere there. These are all the pictures here from Friday night, if you remember. Oh, there she is as well. Lounging. Lounging she is. Next to our iMac boxes. And all of Mike, these are Mike's plastic boxes for when the shopping arrives. But look at her, isn't she just adorable? <laughs> you are, you're adorable. Tell them all that you're completely adorable. There you go. So there's there's some quick Lola-isms. <laughs> <laughs> I think she wants to be the star of the Who show. Who you up? Of course you're the star of the show. <laughs> right, let's have a look here. Um, mm, there's room for everybody in Dee's bu bubble of denial. Excellent. Excellent. Take your rational, rationality and scepticism off of the door. Absolutely. It's 1985 and I'm going to a U2 concert. Yay! <laughs> uh, have I seen Morfolio Trace, an iPad app about architecture? No, I haven't, but I will follow that up. <laughs> you never need it, but you just want it. <laughs> Want and need. <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. Yes, it is her sofa. Nobody else gets to sit on there. And that's her blanket. She co-opted that. That blanket was there when she arrived. That's um, where we have breakfast. Yes, together. She takes up most of the sofa. <laughs> Mike sits I, I on, on, on the seat on, at the on end. The end. <laughs> I know. Can you imagine? A full two-seater leather sofa and, and it's the dog's bed. Yeah. And, you know, she looks at your dag as if it's cold and you've not put that blanket on right. If that blanket isn't situated just right covering a little paws, you know all about it. As you've heard, she can get quite vocal when she wants. <laughs> oh, They say animals are stupid, but she knows she's been taught. Oh, she does. She does. Absolutely, she does. She got that blanket. The blanket was already here. We adopted her when she was just four, wasn't she? Mm. Yeah, a little bit over four. Um, so she moved in the 1st of October when she was four and she spots the blanket. It's like, it's OK, that's my blanket. So we put it on there and that was it. It's now her blanket. But, you know, it looks so cute. <coughs> but in, in Manchester United colours as well. There she is, red, white and black. Mm. Dare I ask how the game went? Good words were said. Oh, good grief. Good bad, words were said. The last I heard, bad words bad were said. Bad words were said. <laughs> but now good, good words, words have been said. said. Yeah. That's all right then. I'm glad because I'm not keen on Villa. You know, you know my feelings on Villa. So, yes, we need more Lola, don't we? Actually, there was a guy presenting a session that I was watching and he opened it out with a picture of his dog. And the dog is a husky. Beautiful, beautiful husky. So he says, you know, and I want to know all about you. And if you've got pets, then put the picture of the pets up. <laughs> Turned into a pet love fest. <laughs> oh, a Jack Russell terrorist. <laughs> Oh, Jack Russell's my friend at a Jack Russell, ever so cute. But they've got a, there's a lot of personality in a small parcel there, isn't there? Oh, and Wayne's avatar is Marley. You do not look like a Jack. <laughs> He's cute, and Marley's a nice name too. Oh, and Carol's uh, Carol's Jack Russell. Oh, 12 and a half. Wow. Sleeps on the sofa in the day in our bed at night. Yes, Lola has the majority of the bed in the evening, uh, and she lets it be known if she hasn't got enough room. 
And while she looks so tiny when she's curled up on her own bed, funnily enough, when she's in our bed, she takes up the entire king size bed. And you're lucky if you've got enough room for a pillow. But don't disturb her because then she gets very cranky. <laughs> Anyone with pets will know exactly what I mean. And do you know what? I have I have lay there in the winter, December. No quilt because she's got it all. Feet hanging off the bed, head hanging off the bed the other side and thought, just suck it up. You know, it's not worth waking her and moving her. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, wow. The, Marley's 12 and a half too. They're great pictures anyway. Love them, guys. Love them. So if that's it for questions and we've had a rare old chat, I'm going to head off. I am going to head off and we'll, we'll be back with you same time, same place next week with Textiles in Affinity Publisher. So for the moment, I'm going to say good, good evening from me. And good evening from me. And we will both see you next time. Thank you for being with us and have a fabulous, fabulous week. <laughs>